Uh, welcome everyone on the second session of the third day uh, of our conference, uh, 50 Years of Bangladesh Retrospect and Prospect, organized by Center for Policy Dialogue and co-sponsored by the South Asia Program of Cornell University. Uh, we are here for the sixth session of the conference on culture, and we are delighted to have uh, Professor Iftikhar Dadi as our uh, chair of, for this, this session. Uh, Professor Dadi is uh, John H. Burris, uh, Professor and Chair of uh, the Department of History of Art uh, and uh, the Director of the so South Asia Program at Cornell University. Um, he uh, researches modern and contemporary art from a transitional uh, perspective and also an emphasis on methodology and it intellectual history, uh, particularly of, with a focus on South and West Asia. So I will hand over to Professor Dadi, uh, Honorable Chair, to you, uh, and I'll do the timekeeping for you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Taufik, um, and thank you, um, Professor Ronak Jahan, and uh, for organizing this uh, this amazing con and to CPD for this conference and for uh, inviting Cornell University to be a partner. Uh, so I'm I'm uh, I'm the director of the Cornell South Asia program, and uh, on you know very happy to be here on in the institutional capacity, but also personally, I've been visiting. Uh, Bangladesh since uh, 2015 and have really been struck by the remarkable achievements in in all dimensions uh, of Bangladesh life. So this conference is I'm learning a lot from this conference and I hope the, the the emphasis on cultural issues in this panel will also add a dimension to to our understanding of what Bangladesh has achieved. Uh, so we have a very full panel today. We have four presenters uh and uh, uh the, the way we will proceed is that we will uh have the four present presenters first present their papers uh then there will be two respondents um to the papers and uh then we will have uh, a, a time for a discussion uh for the audience if you have questions or observations please uh, type them in the in the chat box is that correct uh yes um yeah okay yes that is and, correct and we hope to have some time towards the end for uh, for a discussion uh, and also to to address some of your observations and questions. Um, so let me now first begin by introducing the first speaker. Uh, the first speaker is uh, Professor Fakhrul Alam, who is the director of Sheikh Mujib Research Institute for Peace and Liberty and was the UGC professor in the Department of English at the University of Dhaka. He has uh, numerous publications, including Bharti Mukherjee, uh, Jimanananda Das, Selected Poems, South Asian Writers in English, uh, The Essential Tagore, um, uh, an edited work, uh, also translations of uh, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman's uh, Unfinished Memoirs and Prison Diaries, um, and, uh, and many, many other uh, publications. Uh, it's, uh, in the interest of time, I'm keeping the bio short, and I would like to now invite Professor Fakhrul Alam to make his presentation. Thank you, Professor Iftakar, and uh, I'd like to uh, say salam to uh, Professor Rahman Soban, and uh, Apa, I've already uh, greeted and the rest of my co-panelists, I'd like to welcome uh, everyone listening to this, uh, to my presentation. My paper is called Locating Bangladesh's Meandering Contending Mindscapes in History and Our Time. So here I go. Growing up intellectually in the 1960s and having been admitted to the University of Dhaka in 1969, was instantly initiated into situations indicating that two cultures were about to collide frontally. On the one hand was the cultural movement that reflected the side of the burgeoning political movement of the period that had stirred the Bengali consciousness of the part of the country caused by the partitioning of India called East Pakistan strongly since February 21, 1952. And on the other was the persistence of the Islamic consciousness in the century that, that had perhaps begun as setting itself from the time of Bongo Bongo or the partition of Bengal, and that had peaked with the creation of Pakistan. Tagore was inevitably caught up in the politics of the period, and we witnessed then repeated attempts to stop broadcasts of Rohini Shungit on the radio and remove the writer composer uh, from the curriculum to supplement the values, uh, to supplement the attempts being constantly made by the government to inculcate its notion of Islamic values and propagate Islamic cultural icons in every possible way. One is reminded at this point of the rubric controversially utilized by the British scientist and writer C.P. Snow in his 1959 read the two lectures. So as if two lectures were about to, uh, two cultures were, uh, two cultures, as if two cultures were about to collude. He, he was talking about England and a different context. 
What, but one is reminded particularly here of the phrase culture wars that has been bandied about in the West in our time, especially during the Trump years, when it seemed to suggest that another clash of civilization was evolving. Needless to say, our neighboring country has also clearly been showing signs of similar simmering tensions in its body politic. Underlying these issues, whether in Bangladesh or India or Myanmar, as well as the United States and many other parts of the world, surely are conflicting notions of culture. Raymond Williams notes in the long revolution that there are three distinct but mutually reinforcing issues implied. That of an ideal culture or a state of process of human perfection in terms of certain absolute or universal values to use his words. The second is what he calls documentary ones, written or not, in which quote, human thoughts and experiences are variously recorded, unquote, and then analyzed. Finally, and what Williams goes on to, Williams goes on to emphasize subsequently is the notion of culture as a way of life or to be precise, a particular way of life, that is to say, social life. All the three issues are relevant to my discussion. This paper will make use of his notion of culture since it, since it expo intends to explore the meandering contending mindscapes of Bangladesh as manifested in its cultural markers in recent decades. In a nation now all set to celebrate its good, good, golden jubilee, but it will do so also by taking into account issues of national identity formation that have persisted well over a century now. I've wrote, written two papers related to the subject previously. In the first, the University of Dhaka and National Identity Formation in Bangladesh. I discuss at length the role the institution has played for nearly a century now. That is quite extraordinary. In doing so, I follow Etienne Balibar's observation that national ideology involves ideal signifiers. I see following him state formation involving a strategy of differentiation, implicating in the process identity markers such as race, religion, and language. I discussed in my paper the way Dhaka University or DU impacted upon, was impacted upon by colonial impositions, such as the first partition of Bengal, then that of India, and finally of Pakistan, reflecting distinct phases and nuances of the history of the region. In addition to Balibar, in my paper on DU, I made use of the ideas propounded in William Van Shendel's essay, Who Speaks for the Nation, where it shows how national identity formation in Bangladesh reflected ideological tensions and the impacts impact of conflicts based on the one hand on ethnicity, religion, and sovereignty, and on the other of equity, democracy, and citizens' rights. Utilizing these ideas, I pointed out in my paper that on view that the institution has been seen origin, or originally as a place where Muslims of the region would be able to access education at the tertiary level in a manner that would redress some of the wrongs done to them by colonial impositions. However, it would also be a place where they would inculcate liberal and democratic values. Uh, and I pointed out, point out how uh, the university area, uh, the sculptures, the wall writings, etc., and uh, the festivals that go on all that time reflect these, uh, the Bengali, but also uh, at least a few of the Islamic uh, sites. The second paper I wrote on the subject of national identity formation that has cultural implications for all Bangladesh is titled Rabindranath Tagore and National Identity Formation in Bangladesh. In, in it, I point out that in the Pakistan period, in effect, in effect uh, attempts were made to minimize Rovina's presence in the Bengali department syllabuses. But the contestations over Rovina seem to have largely ended and he has been rehabilitated. And uh, that is uh, in a short discussion of the paper. So to my paper itself, locating Bangladesh's meandering contending mindscapes in our time. In recent decades and after the restoration of democracy in 1991, the ideals, the nature of the documentary records, and the ways of life that inspired the generation that created Bangladesh and that had been sustained for over some decades seem to have been undermined in some crucial ways. There are now too many obvious causes of concern, causes of concern and disturbing developments that appear to endanger values sanctified in the 1972 constitution. Indeed, in recent decades, there are even signs that a clash of cultures may be in the offing, something we now have to worry about, although from the 1950s, the Bengali strand and the Islamic strand of Bangladeshi national identity formation had mingled, resulting in the dominant impasse that led to Bangladesh. These issues will be the focus of my attention in the remaining part of my presentation. I will try to provide some examples of these manifestations of thought-proving changes and discuss briefly their implications for anyone considering the cultural whirlpool in, future, in which future generations may be thrown into, focusing particularly on pertinent aspects of threats to the Bengali ideals of Bangladesh enshrined in the constitution upsetting documentary evidence of such threats and sobering evidence they provide of how the ways of life associated with the liberation of Bangladesh are being undermined. 
I will also note briefly the telltale signs that have been appearing, suggesting dangers in cradling the core Bangladeshi values I've identified about. I'd like to begin with the round of activism evident in the formation of Ekatur Dalal Nirmul Committee on 19 January 1992. Thereby, pro liberation cultural activists, activists came together to not only expose and indict anti liberation forces uh, who had been reorganizing and taking advantage of the insouciance of military governments in power since August 15, 1975, but had also agitated to expose the persistence of fundamentalist and communal mindsets in post-liberation Bangladesh. Clearly then, there was growing evidence at the end of the 20th century of secular democratic forces pitted against fundamentalist and communist ones, indicating the possibilities of renewed confrontations between the two strands underlying Bangladeshi national identity formation in the future, and causes of concern for those believing in combating obstacles thrown at the path, at the path of the foundational values of the nation. Uh, I then talk about, uh, you know, the, uh, after the Ghatar Dalal Committee, I talk about uh, other developments, uh, for example, the uh, proliferation of Kwame madrasas, till then unrecognized by governments, but uh, purportedly based on the Islamic Diobandi model of Islamic religious in institutional instruction. The recent spread of these madrasas and their official recognition by the government in power in 2006 seems to suggest that a madrasa system opposed to the earlier stream of Islamic religious education that was only stream officially recognized till then could now exist, although funded entirely privately. Remittance, increasing affluence of certain people or groups inclined to do acts of Islamic piety, support from forces based in the Middle East, and eventual official acknowledgement of the rights to exist and even thrive clearly appeared to have led to the rapid spread of the Kwame Madrasas. I remember a friend who fought in the liberation one pointing out to me way back uh, when we were going uh, uh, through uh, on, uh, across Prabhupada Sharani, the longest road in Dhaka, how from where it began to Saidabad and beyond, a string of Kwame Madrasas has suddenly appeared out of nowhere and were now bordering this part of Dhaka city. At this point, let me remind you of the argument I've been developing till now, though I have rushed it, about Bangladeshi national identity formation and the two strands that contributed to it. Till the beginning of the 21st century, they came together in reinforcing the national impulse that led to Bangladesh. But subsequently, the two stands would, stands would be entangling with each other. The tensions marking this interaction, however, seem to have receded to the background for a brief while towards the end of the 20th century. In particular, the Islamic strand had apparently minimized its presence at this time. But the strand emphasizing the overwhelming Islamic majoritarian practices prevalent in this part of what was once undivided Bengal resurfaced in the public sphere visibly in the new century, stressing goals and displaying a way of life that had not been in the cultural limelight for some time. Indeed, by the end of the first decade of the two centuries, the two strands seemed to me to be inclined to confronting each other again and again. I think I will run out of time, but uh, let me just say that I talk about the next uh, step, uh, which was the uh, Shabal Andolon, uh, which took up where the Ghatuk Dalal uh, Nimul Andolon left and uh, rallied uh, young people and uh, older ones too. Uh, I, want, I also want to point out that this movement did not start in Bortal of Dhaka University. Uh, but from Shahbag, there seems to have been shift in the, uh, in, in the epicenter of these movements. Uh, this, and this was countered soon, and I discussed this in some detail, by the Hefazete Islam's uh, Shapla Square protest, which is what the English newspapers um, uh, termed it at that time. Uh, and, and, and so what we had was obviously this uh, tussle between uh, and the secular Bangladeshi strand and, uh, and the, the Islamic one, uh, in, in not really a tussle, but a, a kind of a confrontation. And the, in, in, and the Hefazat Muslim movement began to grow stronger and stronger, and soon came up with a list of demands, which if met could fall, fundamentally alter Bangladesh's cultural landscape, prohibiting the free flow of ideas, free mixing, women's right to claim equality with men, and the rights of minorities to practice their faiths openly. Uh, uh, the government in power, the Amadi government, uh, soon recognized the Kwame degree uh, and uh, the proposals of the Kwame Mother authorities backed by the Chirong-based Islamist group. Uh, and 
soon they were uh, soon Dawara certificates issued by them were recognized. Uh, I will run out of time soon, but let's, let me go quickly over some other signs that must have alarmed anyone who valued the emergence of Bangladesh because of the confluence of secular, democratic, and egalitarian ideas feeding into Bangladeshi nationalism. The countering movement against first the Shabang Andalon and later the hanging of a few of the men implicated in war crimes led to attack on some government offices, police stations, and not a few minority communities. The Ahmadi government for a while appeared to keep following a carrot and stick policy to deal with such outbreaks of intolerant Islamism, using force and repressive techniques, but also conceding to emphasize Islam's demand here and there. Oh, As a result, two minutes. okay, I'll just go on to the end because I talk about other uh, events such as the attacks on sculptures, uh, attacks on temples, panels, shoid minars, and minority communities, uh, which have um, marked our cultural landscape for a while now. And you know, the, apparently, uh, let me read the last two paragraphs if I have the time. Anyone who contemplates recent Bangladesh history and has witnessed the tracks left by different groups in opposition with each other will surely note like me that we're going through an uncertain period. No doubt the country is progressing steadily and confidently and the, and, and the economy is moving forward. But science everywhere tell us of contrary forces and mindsets, constricting the free exchange of ideas and on coalition courses. Uh, the ideas led, that led to the birth of Bangladesh have been visibly and audibly challenged. Obvious documentary evidences of cultural freedom like sculptures have been attacked occasionally and ways of life have changed markedly and quite often in ways that cannot be said to be progressive. Culture certainly has become a contested terrain. My last paragraph. Is Bangladesh meandering from the path that led to our independence? Are we in for another round of ideological ferment and cultural clashes signifying two cultures on a coalition course? And are we showing more and more evidence of schizophrenic national mindsets that need to be treated without further delay? Will we all bow to be guided anew by the spirit that led to our liberation? And will we, will, will we be celebrating Victory Day, December 16, 1971, this golden jubilee year? upholding the progressive values associated with our war of independence that have been nurtured by the majority of our population for a long time now. All I can hope for is for us as a nation to move forward and not regress not only economically, but also culturally. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Fakhrul Islam. Uh, our next Alam. presentation, Alam. Uh, Fakhrul Alam, I, I, excuse me, yeah. Um, my, our next presentation will be by uh, Dr. Sayyid Manzurul Islam, um, uh, who is the Professor of English and Humanities at ULAB and recently retired from University of Dhaka. He's an award-winning fiction writer and art critic um, who curated Bangladeshi art exhibitions in uh, UK, India, and uh, uh, Iran. His, his areas of interest include Shakespeare, modern poetry and fiction, literary theory, postmodernism, uh, post-colonialism, and he's a noted columnist writer, column writer and contributor to the leading Bangla dailies and writes on political and social issues. He's also a, a po political analyst uh, on occasion for the BBC. Uh, Professor uh, Sayyid Manzurul Islam. Thank you, Iftikhar, and good evening to everyone, uh, and good morning to Asfar and uh, Professor Adnan. Um, I, have, I hope uh, in the 14 minutes I have been given um, I can make a reasonable summary of the views I have presented in my paper. If there are any gaps or lack of clarity, I hope uh, the Q&A session can take care of that. The title of my paper is The Changing Faces of Culture, Notes from a Time of Crisis. So changing faces of culture and crisis, these are my keywords. Culture is a word. Um, which invites construction of multiple discourses that describe its leading energies, uh, activities, and products, its relationship with politics and the material universe, and the shifts and changes in its signifying practices and ideological positions. Now, these define and redefine such phenomena as autonomy, domination, subordination, manipulation, resistance that characterize its different modes of operation and representation. In communities such as ours, where cultural categories, high, low, um, popular, mass, are unclear and indeterminate, 
and are subject to overlaps. Any attempt to draw defining lines may only be tentative because cultural changes and shifts are more visible now than ever before, and their impacts more widely felt. In the light of these shifts, the latest, of course, the visual turn of our culture, academic and theoretical positions on culture, although helpful for the historical and critical insights, are also subject to revisions. If, for example, culture is understood as a network of signification, as the Marxist culture critic Raymond Williams maintained, through which a social order, and this is a quote, a social order is communicated, reproduced, experienced, and explored, then the new trends in Bangladeshi culture, especially after it took a visual and then a virtual turn, beginning in the late 1980s, appeared to be at odds with the assumption of social order that is good enough to be explored and communicated. The very idea of a social order has undergone significant changes in the last 50 years, beginning with the hegemonic and reliable system of social relations that usually helps various power groups to ext extend their control to the one informed by Marxist and socialist idealism. And we had that phase, uh, idealism which expects the elimination of inequalities in material and political resources to one influenced by the increasing role of religion in society and politics to the one that we are witnessing today which highlights the inequality among economic classes, the marginalization of the poor, the peasants, and the workers, and a promotion of the role of religion and the new forms of capital. This is a return, unfortunately, to the earlier neo-colonial hegemonic order that the war of liberation was expected to end, but never really succeeded, although in a more dominant and repressive form. At different stages of Bangladesh's journey as an independent nation, the idea of order proved to be unrealizable in spite of attempts by the dominant ruling classes with active support from the capitalist entrepreneurial class to ensure it so that the threat of resistance is minimized and economic activities continue unin uninterrupted. This was so because of challenges coming from a large number of youths either disappointed and frustrated by the failure of the state to deliver on the promises of the war of liberation or thrown into uncertainty by the rising unemployment or both. From the workers and peasants fighting for their increasing marginalization, although they could not make much headway because of a lack of organization, and from left-leaning political parties carrying on, their, carrying on their idealistic mission of a reversal of the hegemonic, hegemonic order, but they also could not make much um, uh, headway uh, either. Along with these, some other factors have also contributed to the destabilization of the assumed order, such as the rise of authoritarianism, the subversion of social, political, and state organizations by self-serving politicians and other actors, the endemic spread of corruption, and the emergence of new forms of domination brought on by consumer capitalism, in such areas as education and the media, which have traditionally been supportive of culture. With the arrival of the visual culture and the world wide, wide world of web, the internet that is, the image became the contender and sometimes a replacement of oral and written texts as meaning producer and interpreter of everyday life with the power to influence the representation of the world. The power of the visual media with its ability to communicate messages and meanings instantly and in unpredictable ways and its elimination of the distinction between the educated and the illiterate, the privileged and the denied, made it both the creator and disseminator of new cultural forms, habits and lifestyles that complicate the idea of a stable social order. The spread of internet connectivity in the last 15 years, during which the country has seen a phenomenal growth of mobile telephony and data transmission, together with the proliferation of video platforms and the social media sites, has fast-tracked profound changes in the way culture is perceived and cultural practices are defined. The changing faces of culture in our time, which also show a deepening crisis that is increasingly marginalizing the values that constitute the realm of the ideal 
another quote from Raymond Williams, and promoting those that are increasingly assuming a market dimension, a cult attachment, or a consumerist orientation, or sometimes a combination of all three. The crisis can be better understood if we place it against the expectations we traditionally have from culture, which in its ideal form incorporates multiplicity, pluralism, and a global worldview strongly rooted in the local, a Catholicity of spirit and an appreciation of difference. It remains an ideal, but not necessarily utopian, because it has its own faults as well. But it was possible for this collective that created the collective that is the, the, the national um, understanding of Bengalis during 1971. We mounted a challenge to the Pakistanis during the 1971 war because we are united on many of these ideals. Unfortunately, that is no longer the case because after the regime change in August 1975, there was a noticeable shift to a new form, form of nationalism, which was called Bangladeshi nationalism, which was an apparently unproblematic but potentially divisive description that narrowed the scope of Bengali ethnicity within the borders of Bangladesh. The main intention of the new political actors was to strike at the roots of the liberal, inclusive, broad-based, non-communal and, and progressive culture that the Bengalis had practiced so far. They were false, but that was more or less the major ideas that I'm presenting of that particular culture. The operation of their ideology, the new actors, noted for its anti-historicism, anti-humanism, and suspicion of anything considered secular, became visible when they attempted wholesale revision of linguistic, ritualistic, cultural, and social terms and practices that had assumed wide currency in the three decades prior to their assumption of state power. So that was a, a shift that created another crisis. By the late 1980s, it was quite apparent that our culture was showing a marked shift towards a right-wing, unprogressive stand characterized by its aversion to the inclusive and liberal cultural values that have historically guided the Bengalis in their day-to-day -day life and their struggle for identity and selfhood. There was, however, resistance to the rightist ideologies by such dedicated cultural bodies and groups as Udichi, village theater, street theater, which continued for quite a while, but eventually lost steam because of a lack of coordination and a dedicated support base. The group's inability to ensure their visibility and activities throughout the year meant that they could not transform themselves into a source of strength for a coordinated cultural resistance. And then there was this emergence of an urban youth culture under the influence of Western rock bands. This is a major trend in 1980s, dubbed band music, which got acceptability among the educated youth, mainly in the urban centers. If this culture clashed with the traditional values associated with music and aesthetics, it also flouted the conventions of conservative ideology that was gaining ground at different levels of society. The new youth culture, however, never promoted itself as a resistance force. And I have two more minutes. I can uh, finish within these two minutes. Then came the visual turn, and we know what the visual turn uh, has done. Um, there are availability of um, the, the, uh, of different uh, share, video sharing platforms, the social communication sites, and new media, which is digital stimulated, simulated and interactive dimensions, which further complicated the cultural scene. Although media theorists have suggested that the new media empowers people by making information and educational materials easily accessible, thus promoting democracy and global communication, its dark underside reflects the very different ways it is often used. Now, there are two kinds of users of this new media. I've suggested one power part, which is actually driven by the desire to know, push the boundaries of knowledge. There is no doubt about that. But there is also another group which uses for all kinds of hate message messages, um, uh, spreading radicalism and spreading lies, 
so that is also a clash there so as number of numbers of users increase abuse of the internet and network connectivity in general will also rise that is our fear as things stand now the convergence culture i'll explain this in a q and a session if anyone asks me the question convergence culture brings home a number of points briefly these are a clash of intentions and purpose the internet and converging devices are used both positively and negatively and that is a problem that you have to really look at because spreading hatred uh, radical ideologies violence drug pornography human trafficking this could not be cannot bode well for a country and then emergence of a virtual culture centered on viewing pleasure fantasy and hyper reality then the visibility of subcultures youth gangs for example and niche cultures they are also being promoted in our time so how to go ahead uh, the way forward i have also suggested how this can be taken care of first of all we have to make use of the same technological devices and technologies available by the groups which are against our culture against the beauty and aesthetics of our culture we can take take use make use of the same devices and same technologies to spread our culture it is possible so uh, that, that that will create a level playing field and uh, increasingly maybe make us more empowered to share our thoughts on a wider platform secondly if education is informed by cultural values then i as a teacher will always emphasize the importance of broad based inclusive education education which has a built in component of culture in it not simply education but the culture of education and education of culture these have to be promoted so that students can internalize cultural sensitivities ideals and practices and that is the only option may be left for us to pursue as we celebrate the 50th year of our country's independence and look forward to its transformation into what you all desire golden bengal Thank you very much, Iftikhar. I saved you some time. <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor uh, Syed Mansoor Islam. Uh, I am now going to be the next paper is by uh, Kazi Khalid Ashraf, and uh, who is an architect, urbanist, and architectural historian. And currently directs the Bengal School of Architecture, Landscapes, and Settlements. He has taught widely in numerous universities in the United States at the University of Hawaii. University of Pennsylvania, Temple University and Pratt Institute. He received his uh, master's and PhD, a master's from MIT and PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, he has published widely. Uh, publications include The Hermit's Hut, Architecture and Asceticism in India, Designing Dhaka, a Manifesto for a Better City, and An Architect in Bangladesh, Conversations with Mazhar al-Islam. and um he has also he has many other publications and also has uh, curated exhibitions on modernist architecture uh, from south asia uh so please go ahead thank you <clears throat> thank you iftikhar can you uh, hear me i'm going to pull up my images and uh, start from there okay can you see the slides can you see the slides okay um well uh, 14 minutes 16 slides and 50 years of architecture i think i have a challenge uh, this is not a paper i'll be presenting but a series of statements uh, in an essay in 1989 uh, i described the work of a small group of architects in bangladesh as being place responsive that is the architecture responded to the delta place situation and its dynamics and complexities i pursued three ideas in that essay one architectural modernism must be situated within the discourse of modernity in bangladesh or bengal two i saw bengali modernity as a dynamics of acceptance and resistance perhaps best represented allegorically in tagore's home and the world three contemporary architecture that is architecture in the 1980s should be archaeological by archaeological i was really considering architecture beyond the usual pragmatic 
professional framework. As a cultural practice, a broader task for architecture was to restore a relationship with the problematic past. Problematic because there was no continuity anymore. Meaning restoring cultural archetypes that still have possibly deep existential significance and can be beginnings for fresh trajectories for architecture. That was also the first time in the essay I described a group of architectural work as, you know, if you like Bengali. I was kind of uneasy about using that term then, but then there it was. And the first time I tried to link architecture with the Delta. This problematic relationship with the past was due to an intellectual and operative rupture carried out during the colonial regime. And many people have written about it and spoken about it. Even in the 1970s and 80s, the presence of history in the formation and information of architecture was new or negligent. How to deal with that? A major event in that time was the founding of Chetona Architecture Research Society, formerly in 1983. It was spearheaded by the master architect, Mazhar Islam, with a group of young architects. And they were joined by stalwarts from uh, every cultural field. Professor Kabir Choudhury, the writer Shaukat Asman, artists Kamrul Hassan, Rashid Choudhury, Nazimuddin Ahmed, and many others. Chetana principally professed the recovery of architecture from the circle of commerce to the core of culture. I show you a kind of a glimpse of the activities of Chetana from the left poster for an exhibition and the cover of a book, Pundranagar to Shere Bangla Nagar. And the images, you know, if you can read them quickly, plans from Pundranagar to Louis Khan, Shere Bangla Nagar, arguing for a kind of continuity which might not have existed uh, otherwise. So exhibitions, books, magazines, and taking it to the public realm. Uh, those of you who know uh, the, the eminent writer, Shaukat Usman, he was uh, the principal speaker at the inauguration of that exhibition. You can see him in the photograph. So uh, while the 1960s was a decade of the American presence in then Pakistan, with the funding of large projects and the propping up of autocratic military regimes, the period also marked a renaissance of Bengali political and cultural consciousness, which uh, uh, for, Professor Fokul Alam and Professor Said Mandir Islam have spoken about. Historically, this can be seen as the continuation of the more progressive aspects of the 19th century, uh, to, uh, the movement, if you like, Bengal Renaissance, and concurrently to the socialist agendas that Mazharul Islam subscribed to. In the 1980s, in a vacuous and commercially controlled environment, Chetana society emerged as a platform for a projective and progressive enterprise, a kind of lightning rod for new motivations in architecture. And, and the big landmark of that uh, Chetana movement was the exhibition on the book, uh, organized in 1997. I say big because prior to that exhibition and the book, history and culture and the ethics of location were hardly intellectual motivations in the production of architecture. So from that giant step Chetuna took in the early 1980s, it owed massively to Mazar Islam and his intellectual and social vision. And I'm uh, describing Mazar Islam through this sort of quick text from 1992 to 96, from 1968 to 1992, if you have the chance to read them here. So uh, while trained in the fundamental principles of modern architecture, he represented a complex mix of international socialism, Marxist ideology, Bengali cultural nationalism, and uncompromising architectural modernism. And how that, all that worked together, that's a longer discussion or not. His social vision and political activism brought a distinct, distinctive quality to his architectural program which has not been seen in any other stalwarts in the region, in the region by, I mean, the subcontinent. He fought against the entrenched practices of engineers and commercial architects, some of whom at that time operated from Karachi and other places to establish an international and ethical, an international and ethical level of architectural production. 
there are various views of that uh, movement called the Bengal Renaissance. Nonetheless, I consider Mazharul Islam to be the first and perhaps the last stalwart of the Bengal Renaissance in uh, Bangladesh. Um, early modern architecture in Bangladesh. This was framed primarily by climatic and ecological themes, befitting topics of the tropics. It also advanced an utilitarian ethic that coincided with post-colonial nation building. And Mazar Islam was a pioneer in this regard. I, and, and I need to mention examples like Achyut Kanvinde in India, who was sent by the Prime Minister of India in the 1960s or the late 50s, uh, Nehru, to the US to be trained at Harvard and come back and design all the Institute of Management and I'm sorry, the Institute of Technology. Uh, and that was one, one clear sort of drive for nation building. And I see a parallel between Khan Binde and Mazar Islam. And I've actually written about that uh, elsewhere. Mazar Islam produced two notable works in 1953. You can see the art college here in the middle and then the Dhaka University Library, which I'm not showing. It's incredible, he was only 33 years old. Both projects, buildings, set up the foundation and language for modern architecture in Dhaka and then East Pakistan and possibly Pakistan. The works, especially Art College and Nipa building, the one on the right in Dhaka University, represented the beauty of tropical architecture. The paradigm for which was the pavilion. And I, I mean by a pavilion, I mean an idea which I'm showing with the image on the left which is a miniature painting from the 18th century called the Bangla Ragini. And this is the conceptual motif, if you like, uh, as an emblem of tropical architecture. Bangla Ragini miniature may be a condensation of a musical, pictorial, and textual narrative, but it iconized the building, a living habitat intertwined with a tropical environment. And this is not to me about aesthetics, but an ethos of existence with the environment. All rural huts in Bengal is based on this idea. Even if people are not thinking about it as an idea, they build upon that idea. So uh, there is a story of how the bungalow, which we're all familiar with, was derived from Bengali rural huts. I see the bungalow as a machine for living in the hot, humid milieu. The production and circulation of the bungalow came about from the English adaptation of the Bangla, the rural hut of Bengal, as a climatic model for the tropics. But by the 19th century, the bungalow became a global paradigm for dwelling. Now, this is prior to the last 50 years, but nonetheless, I want to point out that the Bangla to the bungalow story is crucial in the development of the global school of tropical architecture a kind of forerunner to current environmental and sustainability ethos. It is in that sense, even if somewhat untold, Bangladesh played a critical role in the history of mid-modern architecture. And on the right, I'm showing a manual, if you like, for at that time East Pakistan, which was uh, authored by Mazar Islam and his American friend and colleague, Stanley Tigerman, who visited Oh, who was invited in Bangladesh to design uh, five polytechnics together. Uh, so a manual or a manifesto for living in a tropical condition. 1960s brought a profusion of foreign architects, many of whom were engaged out of the American presence in Pakistan, which was again part of the great political theater to prop up that nation against the Soviets. No matter how these architects arrived in East Pakistan, their work coincided with the Mazar Islam seminal projects in the 1950s as examples of tropical modernism. Um, while all these works established the language of new architecture, they also heralded an early version of sustainable ethic that combined climate, ecology, and functionalism. An argument for a regionalist architecture was also framed in the climatic logic and science of comfort. And I, I have to say, sadly, many of these buildings, exemplary buildings, are facing the bulldozer now. Louis Khan is an epic of its own. Next to Mazar Islam, the American architect, Louis Khan was the other stalwart in the architecture theater of Bangladesh. Even if Khan was engaged by an autocrat to provide what appeared to be 
a conciliatory project for Bengalis. Khan's work in Dhaka played a key role in, the, in its own evolution and the evolution of architectural modernism towards a more humanistic and as well as geographic dimensions. His engagement with some of the taboo topics of modernism, such as landscape and geography, or location if you like, and spirituality and sacrality, found inspiration and reciprocal significance in Bangladesh. This is the other untold story about architecture in Bangladesh. While the robust geometry of Khan's capital com complex has received greater attention, positively or negatively or otherwise, the urban and landscape themes of the complex remain largely unexplored. And all I can point out right now with the image on the right is what you see is that Khan's design uh, of, uh, of the wetland north of uh, the assembly building, which does, the wetland doesn't exist anymore. Uh, when Khan was uh, toying with the idea, and this is his term, building with the land. He argued for himself that in Bangladesh- Sir, pardon me, you have two more minutes. Okay, in Bangladesh, you need a land architect. Mazhar Islam, in the, uh, by already in the 1960s, was involved in uh, large scale scoped architecture, what I call large scale, involving the overall environment. So I'm pointing this out. It will come back maybe soon. And uh, from the 1980s to 2000, in a sweeping scenario, you can see the next generation building from pavilion form to complex organizations, from simple clusters to urbanistic fabrics. Uh, but the main point that I want to make here is the global presence of Bangladeshi architecture, when, perhaps in which I played a little bit of part. In 1997, I organized an exhibition in New York. Uh, where Mazar Islam was exhibited alongside with four, uh, three other architects from the subcontinent. The Bengal Stream exhibition, which you can see in the middle here, uh, took Bangladeshi architecture to a global platform, unlike any other project. Uh, and uh, architecture becomes then a global ambassador for, for Bangladesh, for all that is positive and energetic. Uh, but I do want to point out a couple of things there before I end. By the 1990s, the challenge lay elsewhere, the city, the future of the city in Bangladesh. No narrative of Bangladesh is complete without Dhaka city. Dhaka remains the architectural, urban, and developmental foci of Bangladesh. I have described Dhaka as a delta city where water creates a delicate nexus, and I've written about it quite considerably. But symptomatic of most cities located in a powerful hydrological matrix, but undergoing furious urbanization. Planning practices in Dhaka have succumbed to the regime of what I call a dry ideology. Since the 1970s, new development uh, practices has prevailed in the organization of cities in which landfills, embankments, bridges, roadways have supported the technology and ideology of a dry culture, pitting the city against the terra aqueous delta. Dhaka, sadly, Dhaka and the delta have become oppositional. I have mentioned building with the land, and I'm just showing two, build, uh, two structures from 1994 to 2012. Uh, and I can't go into the detail anymore, but how uh, the new orientation comes into the work of some of the architects, and it's not, and not only building with the land, but building with water. Uh, if, you know, uh, and uh, I can, again, only just show you the images. But I'll end with these images, the last one. So the next frontier for architecture is the large scale, an integrated rearrangement of our total landscape. This is what the Bengal Institute for Architecture, Landscapes and Settlements has taken up as a mission, which I happen to direct. This is perhaps an appropriate response to Mazar Islam's pre-signed call in 1968 for the need and necessity for large scale, three-dimensional planning for Bangladesh. He said that in 1968. So architecture, landscapes, and settlement, this tripartite focus is an attempt for an integration of divided and isolated disciplines, and most importantly, the organization of land, water, and settlements with an urgency that is unique to Bangladesh, especially accelerated by environmental and climate changes on the one hand, and rushed economic and social transformations on the other hand. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, 
And uh, our, our next paper is by uh, Tanzim Wahab, uh, who is a curator, a researcher, and lecturer. He is the chief curator at the Bengal Foundation in Dhaka. Uh, he has headed uh, many curatorial and research projects and exhibitions, including Breaking Ground, Modern Art in Transition, mm -hmm. featuring the works of modernist forerunners of, the Beng in, of Bengal, Gaganindranath Tagore, Jamani Roy, Zainul Abedin, Kamrul Hassan, and SM Sultan, and also an exhibition called Subtext, a pseudo reading room inside a gallery space examining the symbiosis between text and uh, art. <laughs> Tanzim was vice principal of the Patshala South Asian Media Institute from 2013 to 2015 and the curator of co-curator of Chobi Mela photo, Photography Festival, Dhaka, at the editions of uh, between 2013 and 2019. So, Tanzim, please go ahead. Thank you, Iftigar. Uh, can you hear me? Am I audible? Okay. So, thank you for having me. Uh, special thanks to CPD uh, and also uh, Cornell University. Uh, and uh, right before starting, I just want to... Uh, uh, just uh, tell you that you know my approach will be more like a curatorial inquiry. I'm not a, an art historian, and so the uh, the um, the presentation I'm going to make is not uh, trying to look into historicizing art, but trying to see the Liberation War of 1971 and whether it became a formative moment, a decisive moment for art of Bangladesh uh, to have its own transition from the ongoing conversation of modernism. And uh, I'll just take a minute to share my screen first, and please let me know if you can see this. Can you see the screen? Yes, we can see it. Okay, great. So the title of my presentation is Contemporary Art Mo uh, Movements in Bangladesh, The Rise and Crossover. And while we are talking about contemporary art movements, I would like to start with looking to the word itself and the way it is being extracted, uh, especially in Western context, because the modernism and the Eurocentric notion of modernism is being highly critically criticized while we are actually going to have our liberation in 1971. And just before starting to show you some of the artworks, I'd like to read this quote by Abul Mansur, uh, which is interestingly a, an epistemic inquiry or intervention into looking into the word modernism itself. Independence has also opened up direct correspondence with the West and a flood of sources suddenly reached the artist. To get out of the complex and demanding situation, and to win their creative freedom, many of our first generation artists retracted into their personal psyche, which was the refuge of many modern artists. But whereas the situation for a Western artist is a natural circumstance, our artists became modern without reference to their society, feeding off from alien sources. The problem of our artists, for that matter, the artist of the third world, here he's referring to third world, is that their audience is restricted to an urban elite. Our artists settle in big cities, cut off from their rural and folk origin, sponsored by foreign buyers and a materialistic bourgeoisie who show a kind of sympathy to contemporary artists. Thus, by the very choice of his profession, our artist becomes part of an artificial culture. So this is a very interesting um, comment on ongoing conversation of modernism in Bangladesh, particularly that time when abstraction of modern art was also one of the leading practices. And there was Rashid Arain, there, is, there was Gita Kapoor, who all were talking about a third world framework uh, against this Western aesthetic regime of modern and postmodern, also to see uh, the artistic practice beyond the binaries. Uh, when I'm talking about binary, it's the binary which was being discussed during the modern art time uh, between primitive and modern, folk and urban, traditional and avant-garde, center and periphery. Although we are talking about canonization of modern art movement, uh, especially from the West perspective, is it the binary or is there a third view 
to look into the new form of art. Um, and there is contextual practice of modernism, which uh, can also be discussed in one part of this conversation. But I will move on with another quote by Lala Rukh Selim, artist scholar and the faculty of Finers University of the Finers Department of Dhaka University. The birth of Bangladesh brought with its hope for a secular, democratic, socialist country where Bengali culture would flourish. Art education institutions were established in Chittagong, Rajshahi, and Khulna uh, after the Liberation War. State patronage of the art was introduced through the establishment of the Bangladesh Shilpakola Academy. The Liberation War provided artists with a fitting subject and imbued figurative representation with new vigor. So interestingly, you know, so 71, I mean, the, the formatic moment, and it brings us to this possibility of figurative art and what was there before the figurative art. So that's one question about it. And also, you know, this particular statement takes us to, takes us to the extension of practice while the artists were, were pretty engaged in nation building, uh, Bengali cultural nationalism, where we have seen artists like Rafikul Nabi uh, and many others to expanded form of artistic practice, including graphics art, banner, a lot of localized movement. So this particular presentation will also try to look into the locationality and to see you know, how it's related with the new internationalism. And while I talk about new internationalism, uh, we know that 19, after 1971, there was a new way of having transnational and translocational exchanges, including uh, non-alignment movement. And interestingly, the photo next to it, you can see it's Nisar Hussein in 2010. So this is two different generations. And as I have said, uh, my presentation is not going to be sequential or te temporal. There'll be some jump cut, cuts just to see you know, how one influences the other over time. So, re uh, in terms of re, uh, representationality, uh, this social realism has uh, revived in 1971, way before that, that when artists were uh, directly engaged in nation building. And these particular two images are giving us a very interesting idea of you know, how time is changed, but still the concern is kind of similar. Uh, so the first poster, we know about it, it's of 1971. But Kamrul Hassan, just before he passed away, he to uh, draw another one in 1988 on the military regime. So the politics of Bangladesh after the 71 and liberation war uh, passed through the binary as well of Bengali cultural nationalism and nationalistic identity and, and also the militarized politics and politicized military and coups in regular intervals. And that clearly had a disruption or a moment of disruption uh, where art itself was com completely part of the movement. This is another example of two different photographers are documenting this moment of demonstration in the street, uh, which became iconic image. Uh, while we talk about uh, photographs as icon, as images, and the first one is a mass, mass uprising in 1969, Gono Bhutan. And we are also quite introduced to Pavel Rahman's famous photograph of Nur Hussein moment uh, before he shot dead by the police. So the body representational element, people in the street and demonstration was there, not only in the documentary photography, but Joinul Abidin's famous uh, Femin sketch and very important work of 1943, which talked about uh, the socio-political perspective behind uh, this event, uh, can also be related with SM Sultan's this particular image. Uh, the date is not found here, but this talks about 1970s Bhola cyclone, and half a million people died in the cyclone, and, and the state was also uh, questioned for its negligence. And there was piles of images with its, its representational attitude, particularly into social realism, looking into bodies, genocide, dead bodies, 
uh, whether it's cyclone and also in war itself, the genocide, which somehow relates with uh, this liberation of war photo archive. Uh, these particular photographs, these two photographs are taken by uh, two well-known photo photographers of Bangladesh, Naibuddin Ahmed and Rashid Talukdar. And both of them were actually trained in pictorial tradition Although Rashid Talukdar had a photojournalistic uh, journey as well, uh, but this particular training and the way of depicting uh, villages and rural life of Bangladesh uh, has shifted in 1971. And this is not merely a documentation. Uh, there is a certain kind of authorial engagement of these photographers to be a part of the war from Bengali's side. So what happened after 1971? There was the strong institutional changes, but there was also uh, a, a desire for heterogeneity in terms of the choice of the medium and the choice of the form. And we also, when we also talk about locationality, uh, it tries to see you know, the material itself, uh, the place responsive material, the sources which are found all around. Can it also be a part of the pra practice as a critical contextual practice? Uh, so another quote by Syed Munzurul Islam, which talks about art after 70s. The art of the 70s developed in different directions. There was thus a wider variety in terms of form and content, in terms of media used. Sculpture, particularly cement and metal casting and wood carving was taken up with a new zeal. Traditional material were also rediscovered. So I move on and just going back to uh, 50s and 60s, uh, especially this particular piece by Novera Ahmed is quite known, uh, Cow with Two Figures, uh, which is also a very interesting reductionist approach where we see a village agrarian society depicted through a sculpture, but not necessarily uh, it has sharp figure. Uh, but this reductionist approach uh, might also be seen as certain kind of romanticized sized, uh, villages, uh, but it also has the kind of practice Novera does has a spiritual uh, inspiration, especially by engaging with uh, Buddhism philosophy and Lalun. Continuing to the dialogue of reductionism, uh, our previous um, discussion, uh, Kazi Khaled Ashraf talked about Mazarul Islam's practice. And there's one, one very particular view of Mazar Islam on symbolism um, as, as a, you know, as a, as a problem. And I, I find it really interesting to see how secular belief in artistic and architectural practice uh, decides a different kinds of position to reduce symbol and just to be inclusive in its society. Mazar Islam says, I have heard so much about symbolism that I think there is a lot of falsity about it. There are two things here. There are people who have claimed symbolism in a work after its creation. And the other thing is to produce symbols. And this has been derived mostly from religion. Even where it is, has appeared culturally, there's a force of religion at the back. I'm always cautious because of it. So this particular reductionist approach of, it's also very, uh, essential is because it is it's not coming from a very puristic minim, minimalistic way of being uh, uh, having a reduced form the way west was also looking into the minimalism particularly that time but mazhar islam uh, is trying to see the essential element also a part of localized conversation bringing in climate accessibility uh, people's affordability uh, into it you have one minute Sorry, I, I was, I did not try to distract you. You have one minute to complete okay. it. All right. Uh, it's, <laughs> if, it's a, if it's a minute, then I'll just quickly go through the slides. Uh, but I won't extend it much. But again, uh, the folk and the tradition when it revived, especially through rickshaw painting, uh, there's this question of Western gaze on Oriental, Orientalism. At the same time, uh, the folk also tried to borrow Borak and many other religious and symbolic uh, symbols which have been taken as a source by many contemporary artists, including Ronnie Ahmed, uh, which is a VR film performance, uh, which was produced by Bengal Foundation, uh, which is an example of VR, which has Arabic 
word of tombs of saints as its title, Seven Mukam. And these are some recent work of Ronnie Ahmed, which clearly shows Riksha paintings, spiritual extended form. There is this uh, self-taught painter, Bahram, who also uses popular art. So I'm just using it as an example of looking into high art and low art notion of that particular time. This is alternative practice, the heterogeneity of experimenting with uh, photographs, uh, performative, lots of darkroom experimentation, and one particular artist, Anwar Hossein, was really influential on looking into photograph as also a symbolic poetic uh, intervention to look into the symbols in a typo typological form. This pa particular image has a photograph, Anwar Hossein's hand, uh, he, uh, his intervention, and also a performance by meme artist, ma mime artist, uh, Parthapotim Mojumdar in 1985 in front of National Parliament building. And 80s was really important to talk about democratic movement. It also talked about gender, uh, Atiyah Islam, Ani, Taiba Begum Lipi. The question of central and periphery in the inclusion came up. And these are some examples of early installation work. Hamidu Zaman Khan in first station art Biennale and Mabu Rahman in the first installation art show of Bangladesh Shilpakul Academy in 1994. Uh, I will probably end here, uh, but I just uh, wanted to talk about Asian Art Biennale as a, I mean, with its spirit of non-alignment uh, to look into the other, uh, especially pan-Asian um, Orientalism to be a part of the exchange and how it became uh, inclusive towards the region around by, uh, by showing work of Nepal, Iran, China, especially with, through the hand of Soed Jahangir in 1981. And there was very interesting and important contribution by Japanese artists of that, of that particular time. And Yoshio Kitamaya, who got the grand prize with this particular early installation work in 1983, was one of the also influences of looking into installation. And, and of course, the mo one of the most important Shomoi group who also talked about Western canonization of thinking and uh, bringing in social realism and critical notion against the autocratic group, uh, government of that time in 1980s. Kalidash Kormukar's performance. And these are some of the performance, how body is being also part of the expression in the critical conversations, including Dhali Al Mamun in early 2000. Thank you. Thank you, Tanzim. Um, so now uh, there will be two responses to the papers. Um, the first response is by um, uh, Dr. Asfar Hussain, who will respond to the, the first two presentations. Uh, Dr. Asfar Hussain is currently interim director of the graduate program in social innovation and associate Pro professor of integrative religious and intercultural studies at Grand Valley State University in Michigan. Uh, he is also vice president of the Global Center for Advanced Studies, based in New York, and uh, professor of English, world literature, and interdisciplinary studies. He has published very widely, and uh, both in in English and in in Bengali. Uh, uh, you know, uh, many cr creative and academic pieces. Uh, uh, his latest book in Bengali is called. Uh, you'll have to help me with this title, Darsha. Uh, oh, Thank you. Thank you. Philosophical Narratives is an interdisciplinary investigation in the fields of contemporary politics, culture, literature, and philosophy. Uh, so please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dadi, for that uh, generous introduction. And uh, hello, everyone. So I've been given seven minutes for each presentation. So I'll first to respond to Professor Pokrul Alam's presentation paper called Shahbag Shapla Chaptur and Bangladesh's Mindering Contending Mindscapes. And within seven minutes, I can <laughs> only quickly comment on, not even discuss, a few issues dwelt on in my teacher, teacher Professor Pokrul Alam's otherwise substantial, question-provoking, extremely relevant intervention. 
at this conjuncture in Bangladesh. It was a privilege uh, to, to, to read his full paper already. So Professor Alam takes into account the issues of national identity formation that have indeed persisted well over a century in what he significantly calls a thrice partitioned country, namely Bangladesh, while he deploys the metaphor of the of, of fissure that I think ages close to the metaphor of crack, the Caribbean revolutionary Franz Fanon uses in that famous chapter called the pitfalls of national consciousness, including in his major work, The Wretched of the Art. To quote Fanon briefly then, I quote, national consciousness is nothing but a fragile shell. The cracks in it explain how easy it is for young independent countries to switch back from nation and state to groups and so on, unquote. Now I will add that although it can be unifying, national identity like nationalism itself is no unitary thing. And there is nothing inherently or ontologically unitary about a Bengali national identity or Bengali nationalism or even Islam for that matter. In fact, they all are sites of struggles, even class struggles and contestations, both progressive and retrograde. Although historically speaking, a strategic national unity was felt to be necessary for combating the forces of colonialism and imperialism, and even what Franz Fanon calls the national ruling classes. And then the question remains, where are the other and othered nations in Bangladesh? And whose nationalism is it anyway? Professor Alam's important intervention has prompted me to think about all these issues that I think Bangladesh's middle class keeps struggling with as we celebrate the 50th birth anniversary of the country. Now, Professor Alam rightly calls attention to certain specific symbols and sites and scenes and subjects that are under repeated violent assaults and thereby he underlines the historically produced antagonisms between what he calls, I quote Professor Alam here, Bengali strand and Islamic strand of Bangladeshi, Bangladeshi national identity formation, unquote, which he argues were mutually inclusive, were mingled earlier, for instance, particularly, if not exclusively in the 50s and the 60s and even in the 70s. But the question of identity as a specific problematic already emerged and continues to emerge. Well, are you a Muslim first and then a Bengali or a Bengali first and then a Muslim? Loosely or broadly, Shahbag and Shapla Choptor are in conflict, although in my reckoning, Shahbag was not a consistently progressive movement. It was notoriously appropriated by the Amulik government at one point. Well, of course, the Shapla Choptor was retrograde for various reasons. It is here where the role of our national ruling classes calls for our critical interrogation. In fact, to put it bluntly, the government used both Shahbag and Shapla Choptor, if not in similar ways. And I agree with Professor Alam when he maintains that. I quote, virulent pro-Islamic and anti-secular movement in Bangladesh could not be wished away anymore. Here, though, I would do well to insert a quick note on the question of secularism, one of the founding pillars of our 1972 constitution. In fact, the question is, whose secularism is it anyway? In the early 90s, when I was working as the general secretary of Bangladesh Lekhok Shibi, the country's oldest organization of progressive writers and activists, and when I was directly involved in the Gono Agalot movement, some of us raised that question. While it was later seen that at least a certain version of middle-class secularism, uncritical of its own colonial origin, can not only be elitist and even flatly anti-religion and anti-people, but can also be dangerously orthodox and retrograde as Islamic fundamentalism itself. In other words, neither Shapla Chattur nor even Shahbag is our answer. Perhaps we need to range beyond 
the Shahbag Shapla Chapter binary to find a, what might be called a third way secularism, organically tied to the lives of common ordinary people. Finally, I should emphatically point out that in addition to the Jamaat and later Hefazat Islam, every major political party, every major political party in Bangladesh has used and even abused religion, among other things, to serve their respective interests and their class interests as a whole, thus continuously endangering their safety. Uh, I'm sorry to hear about two minutes. Two minutes for this, I'm towards the end for this uh, you know, response, all right. Endangering the safety and security of the people themselves, particularly of the poor and women and religious and national and ethnic and linguistic minorities. I think we surely need to move beyond this political culture, to say the least. Let me end here and thank Professor Alam for his excellent intervention. Thank you all. This. And now I will respond to Professor Sayyid Manzurul Islam's paper presentation called The Changing Faces of Culture. Again, within seven minutes, I can hardly do justice to the range and rigor and richness of the constellations of concerns and questions broached in my teacher, Professor Sayyid Manzurul Islam's excellent paper called The Changing Faces of Culture that I already read with much interest, exemplarily enacting an interplay between the theoretical and the historical and the political, Professor Islam mobilizes the Raymond Williamsian notion of culture that encompasses the entire range of not only signifying, but also lived human practices. For me, Williams is, among other things, an exemplary Gramscian. And let me state rather bluntly or even crudely, an obvious, yet sometimes ignored, dialectic posited by Gramsci himself, the Italian Marxist theorist and revolutionary Antonio Gramsci. What is called culture influences politics and politics in turn influences culture. In other words, in the Gramscian vein, it is possible to speak of the politics of culture and the culture of politics in their interplays in an over-determined historic block. Now, without reading Gramsci, Without reading Gramsci, our foremost peasant leader and revolutionary, Maulana Bhashani, at the famous Kagmari conference back in 1957, demonstrated that, demonstrated that culture is political as Bhashani staged his resistance to Pakistani neo-colonial domination at the time. Professor Islam accounts, attempts to account for what he himself calls the many faces of culture since 1971, while rightly calling attention to the visual and virtual terms within their horizon, as well as to the new culture that he describes as convergence culture, while remaining attentive to their imbrication in the political. Taking cues and clues from Professor Islam's paper, I want to comment quickly on our mainstream political culture that has evolved in Bangladesh over the last 50 years, and if time permits, on our literary culture as well. I think at least six, six broad, distinct, yet overlapping and intertwined configurations of practices or trends have come to characterize our mainstream political culture. Number one, the commercialization, rather crude commercialization of politics and the politicization of businesses. Number two, the militarization of politics and the politicization of the military. Number three, the communalization of politics and the politicization of the religious. Number five, no, number four, the bureaucratization of politics and the politicization of bureaucrats. Number five, the criminalization of politics and the politicization of criminals. And six, practices of what a certain segment of the Bangladeshi left already called neo-fascism, increasingly inattentive as it is to the questions of women, poor peasants, working class peoples, linguistic minorities, ethnic minorities, and religious minorities. This then means that over the last 50 years, we have not been able to have a true democratic revolution in Bangladesh. In fact, the dominant political culture of our national ruling classes has run counter to the three fundamental principles of our 1971 National Liberation Movement, 
বাংলায় পড়ি সাম্য ন্যায় বিচার এবং মানবিক মর্যাদা ওয়ান ইকুয়ালিটি টু জাস্টিস অ্যান্ড থ্রি হিউম্যান ডিগনিটি অফকোর্স দেয়ার আর অফিসিয়াল ডমিনেন্ট ন্যারেটিভস অফ প্রোগ্রেস বেসড অন সার্টেন ইন্ডিকেটরস প্রোভাইডেড বাই এক্সটার্নাল ফাইন্যান্সিয়াল ইনস্টিটিউশনস লাইক দ্য ওয়ার্ল্ড ব্যাঙ্ক অ্যান্ড দ্য আইএমএফ বাট আই ওয়ান্ট টু সাইট আ ডেইলি স্টার রিপোর্ট পাবলিশড অন ডিসেম্বর টু আই কোট জাস্ট এ ফিউ ডেজ ব্যাক দ্যাট রিপোর্ট অ্যাপিয়ার্ড ইন দ্য ডেইলি স্টার আই কোট Bangladesh's remarkable economic growth since independence had also led to an inequitable society for a country that was founded on the basis of equality. It is hugely disappointing that as Bangladesh celebrates its 50th anniversary of independence, the country has experienced a rapid increase in equality in recent terms. It is not for nothing that Professor Islam rightly accentuates the need for what he calls emancipatory values to which of course the questions of social and economic justice and equality remain tied of course one can also speak of a certain culture of resistance in bangladesh not always strong and variously repressed by the powerful this culture is that of working class movements including garments workers movements students progressive movements primary school teachers movements people's movements against military dictatorship in the past and so on and so forth well that being said a few words about our sir, literary culture dr professor you have one minute uh, for your enter time i will i'll finish in one minute of course politics political economy culture and literature are profoundly interconnected but the correspondences among them are not necessarily neat or direct or linear i think we can surely boast of our extraordinary mind bogglingly diverse literary productions over the last 50 years professor islam himself is undoubtedly our leading fiction writer briefly our literary culture can be characterized by increasing introspection and experimentation both nationalist and anti nationalist currents both celebration and problematization of what has been theorized as bangaliana in professor islam's paper and increasing preoccupations with the questions of gender class even race minority etc i think i should stop here finally i want to thank my teacher professor said manzurul islam for making me think about the many faces of culture thank you thank you all for listening thank you very much dr uh, asfar hussain uh, may i now request uh, professor adnan murshid to give his response okay uh, <clears throat> uh before i begin i would like to offer my salam to professor rehman soban and uh, uh ronokapa uh, thank you for organizing this it's a pleasure to be part of this group uh, to talk about bangladesh and its 50 year journey Bangladesh emerged as an independent country with an extraordinary inheritance of modern architecture uh, built during the previous two decades from Mazharul Islam's Faculty of Fine Arts in the 1950s to Louis Kahn's Parliament Building in the 1960s this cultural patrimony was both a burden and a catalyst burden because the first generation of professional architects in post independence Bangladesh needed to shoulder the difficult responsibility of drawing inspiration from this cultural heritage and catalyst because these buildings created for the newly minted country an extraordinary cultural foundation on which the project of nation building could develop lest we forget this foundation was also deeply intertwined with cultural constructions of the bengal delta and its complex history of space making For Bangladesh the decade of the 1970s was a complex tapestry of optimism and pessimism a collective yearning to memorialize the heroism and sacrifice of the freedom fighters pervaded all aspects of life the uncertain period following the tragic assassination of bangabandhu sheikh mujibur rahman and his family created an ideological void amidst the social social tension a new generation of ambitious architects burst forth onto the architectural scene of bangladesh in 1982 the national martyrs monument at savar was inaugurated its progressively triangular concrete plates and the optical poetry they compose 
help create a universally admired architectural icon, encapsulating the nation's soaring gratitude toward the men and women who sacrificed their lives for the Bengalis' right to self-rule. When the parliament building was finally completed a year later, more than a decade after the birth of Bangladesh, the parliament complex emblematized the political odyssey of a people to statehood. A post-independence era of architectural aspiration began. Several key catalysts helped specialize this aspiration from the 1980s onward. First, the global rise of an intellectually charged mo uh, movement called critical regionalism that began to influence architectural thinking in Bangladesh. According to the advocates of critical regionalism, architecture must conflate universal values with regional particularities, both reflecting and transcending the native, the indigenous, to usher in a local global hybrid modernity. Second, an architectural study group that Kazi Khalida Shraf talked about, uh, named Chetona, uh, sought to introduce critical thinking and history consciousness as essential parts of architectural practice. Many architects, disillusioned with the prevalent role of architecture as primarily a technical practice without broader social missions, gravitated toward Chetona. Third, the influence of the Aga Khan Award for Architecture, an architecture pri architectural prize established in 1977, was felt strongly during the 1980s in Bangladesh. The award sought to champion regional, place-based, and culture-sensitive architectural impetuses in Islamic societies. Fourth, a historically agrarian country, Bangladesh began to urbanize rapidly from the late 1980s. The country's total urban population rose from a modest 7.7% uh, 7 in 1970 to over 30% in, in 2010. Becoming the driver of economic growth, industrialization, and national urban share of GDP, Dhaka and other cities Spatial demands provoked a wide range of architectural experimentations that also coincided, which has not been explored much, the rise of an aspirational middle class, or what I call a patron class that saw architectural grandeur as a vehicle to assert their social status. A burgeoning class of entrepreneurs who made their fortunes in the country's export-oriented ready-made garments industry, manufacturing and transportation sectors, construction industry and consumer market emerged as a new generation of architectural sponsors. The liberalization of the market and the emergence of a strong private sector resulted in the need for a range of building typology that related and related architectural design services. And happily, architects began to find work abundantly from the mid 1990s. The last two decades in Bangladesh witnessed an intense battle of architectural ideas. The earlier attitudes to more formalist modernism or reg regionalism in the built environment dispersed into a non linear inquiries into speciality and its intersection with society culture, and political economy. Professor Mushan, you have one and a half minute. As architecture increasingly became a matter of pub public discourse, many architects searched for their societal roles in mitigating environmental problems, social inequities, and decadent consumerism. Yet, while architecture rose and thrived as individual plot-based practices, cities, Dhaka is a glaring example, descended into unbearable chaos. In extreme cases, Taj Mahals coexisted with overflowing dumpsters. Private oases and high-end cafes overlooked ghettos. While architects searched for Bengali roots and global, global gravitas in their work, they mostly failed to specialize social justice and embrace a hydroecological view of development. While globalization went on with a new liberal agenda and architectural patronage benefiting from it, social inequity grew manifold. Slums burned, 
and architects rush to the site with naive, superficial aesthetic solutions without trying to understand the exploitative economies and political systems that blight society in the first place. The feeling that architecture is great, but the city suffers gave rise to a new moral quandary. As I go around in Dhaka or another city in Bangladesh today, I keep wondering, is this city fair to all its people? Is this city guided by a basic philosophy of social and environmental justice? Fairness and justice are of course abstract notions and often ignored quietly as left-leaning obstacles to a new liberal worldview typically rigged to favor the privileged and the powerful. This is where I find Kazi Khalid Ashraf's notion of wet urbanism useful. While it embraces the Bengal Delta's quintessential hydroecological hydro geography as both a challenge and an opportunity, wet urbanism uh, is indeed an accusation, a lament, and a, an advocacy for a development model that seeks to ensure a form of eco-justice. The time to decide how we develop our settlements and cities, what kind of socio-environmental ethos we prioritize, and what kind of humanity we institute in them is now. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And uh, I neglected to introduce you, Adnan. Uh, which I'll do very briefly right now. Uh, Adnan is an architect, architectural historian, and professor of School of Architecture and Planning at the Catholic University of America. He received his PhD and master's in architecture from MIT. And uh, he currently serves as a Fulbright specialist and executive director of the Center for Inclusive Architecture and Urbanism at Brack University. He's published widely. And also his uh, recent design work includes eight Brack regional offices across Bangladesh. Um, thank you all the, to all the presenters and to the respondents for your very generous and uh, engaged uh, you know, papers and comments. Um, there's a number of themes that have emerged uh, across the papers and also I'm looking at the chat and seeing the questions uh, there. So, uh, so there is, uh, let me just summarize. I know that the papers range on, on different topics, um, uh, but it, uh, there's one broad question having to do with uh, Bangladeshi identity and its expression in culture, its relation to Islam, uh, the question of secularism or the threats to kind of secularism and a, 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 a sense of equal society into, uh, which is uh, more palpable uh, in the present uh, than perhaps in the, uh, at an earlier period. Um, um, in terms of artistic forms, uh, the question of architecture is uh, was you know articulated very well by Kazi Khalid Ashraf and also by um, uh, by Adnan Murshid. And um, uh, definitely, there's a, as an outsider coming and visiting uh, Bangladesh, I've really noticed the you know the sense of a kind of a Bangladeshi architecture, who's you know in in some ways very rightly Mazharul Islam being a a very important thinker and practitioner who laid the foundations for. Uh, Thinking about uh, questions of, uh, of, uh, of of modernism, of form, but also its relation to uh, to tradition and the landscape and and climate, uh, which has many lessons. Uh, the question I would have is uh, whether um, I, I know that Kazi Khalid didn't have uh, time to develop the last very last slides he shows, but the, I think the question of Dhaka and you know whether Dhaka is in opposition to uh, to the deltaic landscape or the riverine landscape, right? Um, uh, but I'm also, uh, you know, uh, I'm also wondering what the question of density, uh, you know, kind of urban density and the kind of landscapes and might be adequate to Bangladesh being one of the most densely populated, uh, you know, countries in the world, right? So, uh, and um, for Tanzim, uh, Tanzim, thank you for your uh, for your very um, um, important. Um, uh, presentations and slides. Uh, of course, we wish we all wish we had more time to develop these. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I, also, as an outsider, I'm struck by uh, looking at Bangladeshi contemporary art by uh, a number of uh, factors. Right. One is that the very strong presence of, of photography as a as a practice that has undergirded. Okay, many of the so of course painting and uh, you know was always important. You know from the from the time of Jainul Abedin and the modernists, okay? But uh, 
photography also became increasingly important in the last 50 years. And actually many of the artists today who work in installation or work in performance or work in um, video and so on uh, have their basis in, uh, in photography. So there's something I think distinctive, at least in an important dimension to Bangladeshi art practice today, which has to do with uh, its relationship to photography. Uh, the other is, of course, uh, the sense of inhabiting public space, okay, which also Tanzim showed in many of his, uh, his, his, his presentations, the question of the relation of art to, to society, to publicness, to landscape, to, um, uh, to architecture, you know, all of these are also, I think, important values uh, in much of what is happening in uh, Bangladeshi contemporary arts. Um, uh, I wanted to just summarize some of the some of the questions. Uh, so, at, at the very beginning, we had uh, we had an observation that there is no indigenous uh, presenter from uh, you know there is no, and uh, I think this is a point well taken. Uh, and uh, something for all of us to be mindful of, okay, when we plan future events and in terms of how to address the question of indigeneity. I think this also came up with, the, with uh, Dr. Asfar Hussain's response uh, regarding the question of, you know, Bengali nationalism and the question of identity. So I think the, the question of thinking about Bangladeshi identity in, in, uh, in plural and uh, not necessarily unitarian uh, terms might be something to, to keep in mind. Um, uh, other, uh, other questions, of course, have to do, uh, this is just my own uh, speculation regarding the question of, uh, you know, the threats to, uh, the qu question of uh, politicization of Islam, you know. Uh, of course, uh, this is something that is happening in Bangladesh, but I, what I would suggest to, uh, is that Bangladesh is not alone, of course, in this. This is a global movement. And it, in this sense, we might learn lessons also from looking at places like Indonesia and Turkey and Pakistan, you know, in the Islam context, but also next door to India with, uh, with the rise of Hindutva, right? And um, uh, in some ways, uh, I'm not, um, in some ways, we can explain this to external factors or to ideological injections, you know, <laughs> that, you know, the, it's, it's the, you know, it's the, it's a political manipulation or it's the it's a condition of late capitalism or neoliberalism, et cetera. But I think those are not really sufficient explanations, right? And uh, in some ways, there's a new body of scholarship which has to do with the, which is termed loosely the post-secular, okay? Which, which may have actually insights into, uh, I think it's a, to, to vilify uh, the uh, political Islam is only being, um, uh, a, a condition that arises out of ideological manipulation is not a good analysis, okay? <laughs> and uh, I think it might be helpful to look at uh, uh, not just Bangladesh. Bangladesh, of course, is specific in terms of its condition, but also to situate its, really, uh, you know, the rise of Islam and, and its relation to politics in, the, in these other contexts as well. Um, so uh, with that, um, I wanted to open the, the floor for uh, discussion. Um, if, uh, if, uh, I, you know, the presenters or the respondents have, uh, comments on each other's papers or, or thoughts about, uh, some of these overall themes that, uh, that came up, came about, uh, uh we should, uh, we have some time for that. Um, if the car, if I may, I think maybe you can invite the presenters, uh, according to the way they presented first, uh, Professor Fokhtul Alam and then Professor Munzurul Islam, and, uh, and then the four presenters, and then uh, you can ask the discussions and then take something. So uh, Sure, uh, that's, that's great. Let's do that. Uh, my, uh, I would urge everyone to keep their comments brief, okay, and their interventions brief. Yeah. Uh, you're moving to it, Professor Dr. Islam. Yeah, we'll never learn. Thank you. Uh, I have really nothing to add except to thank Dr. Asfar Hussain, my dear student, for such an excellent commentary. Uh, there were some specific questions, uh, three addressed to me that I saw in the chat box. Should I address them now or later? Uh, uh, please address them briefly, yeah. Okay, they, they're similar. Um, so Malik talked about how secular, how Islamic is Bangladeshi culture, and, and, and uh, there was another one on uh, whose secularism is it anyway, and the third one is, uh, defines secularism in the Bangladeshi context. Uh, well, uh, the point of my paper, and I guess the answer that I have, is that it really depends. Uh, it has changed from time to time. Uh, you know, we grew up with a 
a movement towards secularism in the 50s and 60s, which was uh, realized and then uh, enshrined, you could say, in the, in the Bangladeshi constitution in its original Christian form uh, in 72, in one of the four pillars. And then we all know that that was tampered with, that was suspended, and then it came back, but you could say with an attachment. And so, you know, the, the word really depends on uh, when you're talking about it. One thing I'm sure, the secular identity at this point in time is being undermined and uh, challenged in all kinds of ways, is all I can say by way of an answer. Yeah, thank you. But also the, you know, the, the question, one of the questions is, is you, you, you know, there is Bengali identity and there is this, this Muslim identity and the two, you seem to oppose them, you know, and I guess the question no, would be, no, is, I, are they really in opposition? You know? No, I, I, think if they, yeah. I think I said that they coexisted in, uh, in the 50s and 60s, that's what, mm -hmm. that is what I said, there was no opposition really uh, at, at that point in time. And uh, even before in, in, in Bangladesh identity formation in the uh, uh, 20s and 30s, except when uh, the riots started breaking out in the 40s, uh, you know, when, when there was some tense moment. And uh, then there was a kind of an unhealthy kind of, uh, 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 well, uh, not unhealthy, but unstable kind of uh, balance for a while. And uh, after that, it depended on the government and the government's uh, decisions at any particular point of time. So I would say that there was a kind of a uh, equilibrium of sorts, uh, an interaction which was positive, uh, which didn't last uh, in later stages, mm -hmm. which was then reestablished and then threatened again. And that is the way mm -hmm. I would summarize it. And I think what Dr. Asfar Hussain pointed out in his response about, you know, the let's say the threat to secularism or the rise of Islamist politics also may have to do with uh, with the uh, with, of course, kind of late capitalist and, you know, neoliberal global economic order and uh, the role of the state in that. Uh, but also the question of uh, the, the, the marginalized, the dispossessed, the rural, the, the minorities, etc., who may feel uh, put in this place. I, I mean, this is just speculation on my part, but uh, there may be ways to parse this uh, question more uh, through both kind of uh, cultural analysis, but also sociological and anthropological kind of uh, and historical ways of thinking. Uh, Professor uh, Manzurul Islam, may uh, will you like to give yes, a response? Uh, I have a specific question from Mujib Ahmed from Islamabad about the differences between Bengali nationalism or Bengali nationalism and Bangladeshi nationalism. Um, if uh, Mr. Ahmed uh, would have read my paper, he would have really got the answer, but let me be very brief about it. As I have suggested, um, a, a Bengali nationalism is inclusive, has been uh, a plural, respectful of differences of, religi of religions, of ethnicities, and differences in, in general sense of the term. Secondly, it is, it is aware of its internal structural weaknesses. For example, at one time, it did not include the different ethnicities, for example, other than the Bengali ethnicity. And that weakness, when it recognized, it quickly adjusted and corrected. Now we are, Bengali nationalism is more open to the ethnic differences um, about the rights of women, for example, of minorities in general. And it is, it remains to be um, an idea in, or, or a culture in progress. Uh, now in the visual turn in our culture, Bengali nationalism is trying to use this platform <laughs> to spread the messages, which are very, very liberal and progressive. Let me underline that. Now, Bangladeshi nationalism, the term Bangladeshi is not at all a problematic term. We are all Bangladeshi citizens. There is no problem with that. But the problem begins when it is applied from a political perspective, or it is owned by a political party or outfit, which does not include everyone, which is not um, a very um, inviting to the, uh, uh, to the ethnicities, different ethnicities that exist in our country, which promotes a political group over the others or a religious group over the others. So the earlier inclusivity and uh, the pluralistic approach of culture 
was curtailed. It not only confined the Bengalis within the uh, border of borders of Bangladesh, also kind of disconnected the long tradition we have with Bengalis everywhere. So Bengalis are not simply a truncated nationality. The roots are very wide, spread very wide, and uh, there are Bengalis everywhere in the world. So we have to be very inclusive in that sense because time has come when political differences can lead to violence. And with the rise of the kind of violent exercises in the name of religions in the subcontinent, we have to be careful that they do not contribute to that kind of um, classification based on a particular ideology which can lead to violence or lead to threats to the minorities. In that sense, um, uh, Bangladeshi nationalism has been misapplied and misappropriated by these particular groups of political parties and actors who are connected with that. That is my first uh, question that I have. A second concern has been raised by uh, Kate uh, Tanha, I suppose, and I share this concern that uh, my uh, discussion of drugs and pornography has been very black and white. Um, I understand there is a whole gray area involved. The question is why are children or young people driven to drugs? Who provide them drugs? Who ultimately uh, laugh all the way to the bank from the profits made in drug trade? We understand that. But when you see the wasted youths, even committing suicide, many, many young people have committed suicide under the influence of these substances. The substance abuse is a black and white situation in our country. It's a very black. We cannot really paint the stark realities in gray. We have to come out strongly and say things without kind of a nicety is connected with the political correctness. There cannot be a political correctness when pornography is destroying a whole lot of children. School children are losing their interest in education. They are using the devices which are supposed to give them education. They're using otherwise. And one thing leads to the other. The use of drugs lead to violence, lead to all kinds of abuses. So we have to be very strong on these. And if I, as a teacher, um, very sort of, we adjust to the nice sensibilities of people who are not always agreeable to the criticism of drugs. I don't know really whether I am, I should be gray or I should be very strong and my idea should be very strong also. So that is what is happening in our country. So these are to my concerns. I, I agree. I, I share the concern that the person who has written uh, Kate Tanha that maybe it's very black and white, very simplified version, not really simplified. There cannot be any simple simple version of what is such a big national problem and destroying a whole number of youths in our country, increasing number of youths in our country, disabling them, making them totally incapable of participating in social life or any uh, 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 contributing uh, enterprise. So these are to my my responses to the two questions. One question and one concern. Professor uh, Islam, may I ask you another question that came up as well, and also in your talk when you talk about uh, the uh, the role of new 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 media and social media and the kind of let's say hate and misinformation being spread, you know. And uh, of course, this is also happening in other countries. I mean, in India, for example, mm -hmm. there is the term WhatsApp University, you know, which mm -hmm. is the uh, which is the term in which groups are incited or motivated to, to with misinformation and and uh, and uh, sectarianism, okay, through WhatsApp groups and social media. And you suggested that um, you know we need we need both education that recognizes the let's say the depth and importance of uh, kind of cultural uh, you know uh, factors, but also you. You, you, you suggested the use of media to kind of promote that. But the question then becomes, you know, in a, in a, in a decentered, you know, in a landscape that's decentered, right? Which uh, in, exactly. in, in, the, in the role of social media today, how, do, how does one gain kind of hegemony, okay? <laughs> if we were to be Gramscian about it. Okay. Oh, I think, I suppose, I suppose you suggested that too, that when you spread misinformation and disinformation, when you spread yeah. hatred, you have more people galvanizing behind you 
than when you are spreading something which is good for the society and good for the children. I mean, look at the social media sites, which are most popular, or videos on YouTube and TikTok, which spread hatred. These are merchants of fear, let's say. And they are the ones who create uh, unease in the society, create dissensions in the society. I don't think that social media sites are being used productively as much as they are, they are being used in other countries. Especially. So we, are, we did not produce the technology. We do not know how to protect us from the misuse of the technology. That's a big problem. And there is a misconception that only a small number of people who live in the cities have access to these devices. Not really. There have been surveys showing 75% of young people in Bangladesh can access to the internet and devices, which is, of course, growing exponentially over the years. By 2027 or 28, about 95% of the youths can access the internet. So we are talking of a huge critical mass forming. We have the ability to manipulate public opinion any which way they like. So my suggestion is, first of all, um, include the um, education of these devices, of, of technologies, of the new convergence culture within the curriculum of our schools. Sensitize children from the primary school level how to use these devices responsibly. And if you can include education and culture in the real sense of the term, I cannot really define culture that as far as sense task. But uh, I thank you, as part, <laughs> by the way, I will not have the time to thank you for these perceptive comments on my paper. Education is the answer. We cannot have a revolution. There is no, I don't know what radicalism means today, except being radical in a very negative way. Positive radicalism is something that you have dreamt about in our youth, but it's not possible now. But we can change education, and education can change. That is my only um, hope left. If we can address, if we can address the minds of the youth from the very formative stage, you can have a counter-critical mass, if you may, which will bring the changes. Yes, technology will be important. AI, the fourth industrial revolution, will show you tremendous changes in technological landscape. We have to use technology, but we have to know how to use it in a productive way. We have to also be aware that there will be deviations, but a system works if it addresses all the component parts equally. Attentively. So that's the most important uh, lesson that I have learned as a teacher Thank you. over the last. Thank few you years. so much. Thank, Thank you. you for that clarification. I know we are coming, uh, uh, you know, it's uh, coming towards the end, but we were uh, we we requested a little bit additional time. Rona, that's okay. Uh, uh, Tanzim, did you have to leave soon or? I can stay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so can you, can we go in order then with the uh, Kazi Khalid and then your, your response? Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. So Kazi Khalid, would you like to respond to any or uh, aspect of uh, the discussion that has uh, transpired until now? Okay. Well, a lot of <laughs> A lot of things have transpired. You know, one quick observation is that I think there still seems to be a big uh, sort of in the divide between the presentations by the two venerable professors in the first two rounds and then Tanzim said my presentation. And I'm, I'm still looking for a little bit of, you know, a patching here, like a little conversation. Wow. I think you can see them as really two very separate orientations in the discussion. And I wonder where that is coming from. Uh, we could have, you know, perhaps the respondents could have initiated something that could have uh, sort of created a conversation. So that's just an observation, if I'm correct or not. But uh, I would like to just respond to what Iftikhar you mentioned about density, you know, and how kind density, obviously, in all discussions, you know, kind of. Um, head towards Taka. And if I read you correctly, that we're seeing that the density of Taka is leading to the crisis, to Taka's development, so called development in opposition to the Delta. And I say it very in a, in a kind of sloganish way that the Delta mm -hmm. and Taka are in opposition. Uh, I don't quite think that it's density because there are denser cities than Taka or equally dense, but they are still like Liverpool and really, you know, um, you know, 
their work as cities, you know, they're much better in their organization and spaces and all that in every sense. It's not density, but it's actually two things. One is uh, planning mishaps, uh, you know, consciously or unconsciously. And secondly, real estate exploitation of the spaces of the city. You know, the city is a constant battle. And the battle is always being won by a kind of, you know, coordinated group of people who are uh, distributing, allocating the spaces of the city in in with the real estate management. You know, that's what's happening. Which, <laughs> by that I mean that the planning of the city by giving out plots, that's, they, no, no big city do that, you know, uh, versus other models of housing and development. But Dhaka has been, you know, basically is an allocation of plots that's leading to new dry land that has to be acquired and distributed. And where would you find dry, dry land in Bangladesh? You don't. You actually mm. proceed towards the wetlands and fill it up. So that's the kind of thing that we to discuss. So what does that mean? The development is at loggerheads with hydrology or hydrology. You know, that it has come down to. Mm -hmm. Does it have to be that? No because there is still a third option. So it's not all development or all sort of pure ecology, preserving of, mm -hmm. of that. I think there is a third option. And the third option really then relies on a more creative response from architects and planners who have so far failed to provide the third option. They're either going with the development chain or they are becoming activists for ecology. I think the third option is missing and which is perhaps could be a next round of conversation. The other thing is that a lack of conversation on cities, perhaps one of the topics here, perhaps, I don't know, could have been just city. You know, the city not, not just as a physical space, but as a social congregation. And where is that mm -hmm. heading to? And I, by city, I don't mean just uh, the conventional city by any kind of settlement where people are congregating because that's uh, the locus of where we are heading in the next 10, 20 years. And we don't know where we are heading. Mm -hmm. So a conversation of the city, a new envisioning of the city, and to uh, and in, in the context of Bangladesh, that has to deal with the locational ethics. And I mentioned that before, a term, a locational ethics. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Tanzim. Yeah, I think there was a question about um, gender representation among pro-democracy artists. And also there's a generic question about the inclusivity of indigenous representation in terms of not only in terms of speakers, but also, I guess, the artists and cultural producers. Uh, I, uh, I, for, just for the time uh, constraint, I couldn't talk much about the 80s, but what I really wanted to focus on was uh, art education as a whole and critical art education when the mainstream academia are somehow uh, completely uh, neglecting a certain kind of expansion of artistic practice and not only in terms of its formalistic concern of you know having multidiscipline or extra discipline but also trying to see you know how this third view decolonized gaze, this uh, interesting intersectional concern of looking into both uh, post-colonialism and, and the added layer of, you know, post-independent, post-modernist time. Uh, there, there are some self-organized educational activities and especially in 80s, there were so many places starting from this Begart Institute of Photography, uh, the Shomoy started having independent um, Shomoy art, artist group, I mean, they started having independent seminars, critical conversations. They also started publishing manifestations against it. So that's a different way of alternative pedagogy. We brought in a certain critical aspect of uh, artistic practice and also included a lot of uh, diversity, but not into the traditional trap of this modernist uh, uh, homogeneous pluralism, but rather it tried to see, you know, how uh, we can bring artists like Joy Dev Broaza, uh, Konok Chapa, Chakma was also a very important artist to represent a community from uh, within. And there were so many other activities than only producing artwork from the indigenous community. There were so many workshops happening. These Japanese um, performance artists, uh, Seizo Sumoda, went to uh, Bangladesh, came to Bangladesh several times. And there were so many performance art, uh, uh, small scale workshop come exhibitory spaces were there. And all those actually brought interesting change to also the feministic practice and indigenous practice in late 80s and early 90s. 
And there's a very important female uh, pedagogue artist, which I wanted to mention, but couldn't much, but there's a question, you know, why uh, there's not enough of female representations. But I really wanted to talk about Lala Rook Selim's art, not only her artistic practice, but her inquiry towards this decolonized gaze and revival of traditionalism in a very interesting and critical way. Uh, and Tayaba Begum Lipi, Dilara Begum Jolly, there's a long list of artists of 80s, uh, female artists who were really influential in, in the dialogue. Thank you, Tanzim. Um... Any other uh, uh, do do um, our speakers or presenters or respondents have uh, comments for each other's papers? Um, uh, if the car, um, uh, if you could perhaps, if there is not a bonding question, if you can uh, wind up, uh, then maybe in another five minutes. We are already six minutes so you can ask whether okay. people have any other yeah. and before anything uh, if, if, before you end if you can give me two minutes then okay yeah yeah sure so um uh is there uh is there other thoughts that uh, our presenters or respondents have Just quickly, I have to, can I, can I say a couple of things here actually very quickly? And uh, uh, for Professor Dadi, and I, I agree with you when you say that as for this politicization of Islam, mere ideology critique, what, what is called ideology critique is not sufficient. And then you have referred us to a new body of scholarship called post-secular. And can you... Do you have any specific works in mind? I'm just curious, actually. Oh, so no. So, uh, yeah, let me clarify. Uh, sorry, I mean, it's just, uh, you know, this has yeah. just occurred to me because, um, uh, so first of all, uh, uh, Dr. Asfar Hussain, I wanted to thank you also for your interventions and also bringing up, bringing up the example of Bhashani, you know, and uh, uh, who also is pro uh, provides another uh, kind of articulation of Islam and leftist politics, you know, at a time. And, uh, you know, is uh, uh, Leliuddin has been working on on Bhashani, and he's uh, remains an Im important figure, right? Um, uh, no, I, I'm just saying that uh, you know a lot of the scholarship that dealt with Islamic revivalism had to do with either uh, you know uh, either that uh, it's um, a top-down manipulation, right? So it's basically it's the Saudis or it's you know right it's the Diobandis or it's the state which which uh, finds these uh, finds this to be a, a a, a fruitful way to manipulate, uh, you know, and uh, and to uh, and to make claims for power and so on. I just find that none of these are good explanations because they uh, they don't provide an uh, uh, an understanding of why conditions were ripe for something like that to even happen, right? So, in other words, that the ideological manipulation is not a good explanation, right? And one of the one of the things that leftists, including <laughs> including myself, okay, uh, do is that we shortchange the uh, the questions of kind of becoming subjectivity, okay, realization, okay, that these projects may have, they may not be our values, but they are values that, uh, in, in other words, that one cannot understand this phenomena, which is actually a global phenomena, right? And it's actually been happening from really the Iranian revolution onwards, okay? So um, from 1979, you know, if you think about it, if you think about in the 80s, there were places like Iran and Sudan and Pakistan, you know, we're all coming under uh, Islamiz Islamization, right? So, so I think the question of Islamization, its role in politics is not, uh, first of all, it's not uh, an immediate one. Um, and it's also a global one, which has specific articulations in specific sites like Turkey or Indonesia. Okay, but I think this has to do with kind of, I mean, my suspicion is on the one hand, it has to do with late capitalism and the, the, and the crisis of the state. Okay, and which you pointed out uh, very well in your. Uh, uh, another aspect has to do with the kind of decolonization, frankly, and it's an uncomfortable position to to make this claim to say that these are decolonial projects. Okay, and uh, they are finding their way into the future uh, with 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 the aspects of self-realization that may not accord well with secularism and 
and uh, and leftist values, and for for which we need new theories, okay, and also a new kind of politics, which is also what you were trying to say, right? And the post secular yeah. debate, a lot of this you can find in the SSRC imminent frame, you know, uh, websites. People like Talal Asad, Sabah Sabah Mahmood, you know, Hussain Argama. There are many thinkers who are uh, who are working in this uh, in this vein. Uh, and uh, again, they don't provide a politics, but they do provide, I think, a more uh, a deeper way to understand these uh, unfoldings, I think, so that they, they don't become straw man figures, you know, ideological kind of scapegoats, okay, which I think is, a, is, a, is, a, is really both an analytical and a political mistake uh, to do so. Uh, if they can, uh, yeah. uh, we have actually gone... Uh, almost 25 minutes uh, okay. uh, additional time has been given uh, so you have the, the last word uh, no i yeah. would not you can i i only <laughs> wanted to say one thing that first of all generally uh, uh, organizing a panel on culture uh, is not the strength of cpd uh, because generally cpd uh, organizes uh, panels on developmental issues uh, because I was asked to organize this conference, I added a panel on politics, which also generally uh, CPD would not do. And then because uh, I were, Cornell was uh, um, co-sponsoring and I was talking to Professor Dadi, and then he mentioned that he uh, was thinking of a panel at Madison where he was bringing architecture uh, and the artists, then I thought that, okay, then maybe we can uh, do so, but I realized our shortcomings uh, and I, that because we don't really have uh, that much uh, knowledge and outreach to the community. And that is why I uh, agree with uh, Professor Ashraf that we couldn't really, even though I think many issues were interconnected uh, in terms of identity formation and in terms of development, urbanization, uh, we, these four papers, we could not make it a very integrated uh, whole. And, but I think we, I, uh, this is, uh, uh, I accept full uh, responsibility and apologize for uh, my failure. Uh, and I think in future, perhaps CPD will stay within its own expertise. And we, I just wanted to bring different uh, constituencies in conversation, but uh, I also uh, recognize my uh, uh, limitations here. Um, I hope the panelists who uh, came here uh, are not uh, totally dissatisfied with uh, almost two years that they, uh, two hours that they spent with us. And I thank all the panelists and particularly Professor Iftikar Dadi. And Iftikar, you will have the last word. And if you can make it short and sweet, I think that yeah. would be much appreciated. Uh, no, Ronak, I thank, thank CPD for uh, including this, uh, you know, this panel and the Madison panel got cancelled because of COVID actually. So, okay. And I'm glad we had this and I, I, I would like uh, CPD to continue to engage with culture as, you know, the work of both Khalid Ashraf and Tanzim Pahab's presentation show the relationship between cultural practice and, and society and, you know, and, uh, um, and, and other dimensions, you know, society and economy and urbanism and so on. Uh, no, I wanted to just, uh, and of course, this is, you know, no, no panel even of like, you know, can do justice to what has happened in terms of cultural dimensions of uh, what has happened in Bangladesh for 50 years. So, uh, you know, uh, any panel would have been inadequate. Okay. <laughs> and, but I wanted to really thank our, uh, our presenters and our respondents for their very generous papers, your thoughts, your time, uh, and your engagement. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, there are uh, the conference continues tomorrow, uh, so please sign up for uh, uh, for the other uh, panels as well. Okay. Thank you all, and okay. goodbye. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So the thank you very much. Thanks. Recording stopped. Thank you.